My name is Steve Gilman, and for decades I've been helping brands engage with their audiences. On this podcast, we'll connect the dots in the fast-paced world of branding by talking with entrepreneurs, leaders, and marketers on the front lines of telling brand stories. Today I'm talking with Kate Kelly, author and historian. Kate is the publisher of America Comes Alive, and we'll be talking about the power of educational content, writing as a craft, and the importance of learning from history. My guest today is Kate Kelly, who is a talented writer, speaker, and historian. Kate is the writer and publisher of America Comes Alive, a website that features little-known stories of regular people who have made a difference and changed the course of history. Prior to launching America Comes Alive, Kate was in high demand as a co-author for numerous books in business and in medicine. And she, during her re- years of writing, she wrote Election Day, uh, an American holiday, American history. Among other titles, Kate also completed a six-volume history of medicine for Facts on File. Let that sink in a second. Six <laughs> volumes. Uh, that's still used in high school and colleges today. Kate is also a veteran of both local and national talk and news programs and has been quoted in publications such as Time and The Wall Street Journal. She's appeared on World News Tonight, Good Morning America, The View, CBS Early Show, CNN, to name a few, and now she's on our podcast. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, it's really nice to have you here today. As I told you before we started recording, I'm a huge fan. Well, I appreciate that, and certainly connecting with people like you on LinkedIn has been really wonderful. Yeah, it's a really fun, generous community, isn't it? Yes, very much so. Yeah, I've been so surprised and pleased as I've gotten more and more active on LinkedIn, connecting with people like you, connecting other with other creators and storytellers, that I just really enjoy the connections I make. Yes, I think so too. And there's so much more that can be done there too. I realized someone posted a, pulled out something from my, one of my articles that I thought that would be a really good question for LinkedIn. So I'll, I'll get around to that soon. Yeah, that's it. There's so much to do. And with the amount of content you put yes. out, oh, totally. I'm sure you're just working hard every day. So before we dig in to talk about the site, which I love your site, I spent time on it. I really enjoy it. And I kind of feel like uh, America Comes Alive, your site, is the media that we deserve, not the media that we get. Um, because, you know, when you, uh, maybe a lot of people aren't fans of history, and I'm not a history buff. I just have always enjoyed history. But the way that you approach it is very human, very empathic. And I feel like I learned something, not only about the thing that you're telling a story about, but it always seems to apply to today in some way. Even, even if it isn't directly, I feel like when we look back, we actually learn about what's going on and what might happen in the future. Exactly. No, that was my intention. And I guess I grew up in a small town community where, you know, Rotary and Kiwanis and places like that were very popular. I didn't know them very well when I was growing up, but my father did. And it was one of those things like I knew, I knew that Americans want to know more about our country. And then since that time, I've done a lot of speaking with those organizations. They do want to know stories about our country, but they're not going to go to the library and check out a David McCulloch 500 page book about the revolution. But they will read something if you have bro- broken it down into something that might apply, apply to them today or tomorrow or whenever. Yeah. And you make things really digestible. So we're going to dive in and really talk about your content and talk about the website. But before we do that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about your early career. And, um, you know, you're a really prolific author. You, beyond six volumes of of medical uh, history and knowledge, which is, by the way, one of the most impressive things I've ever read. uh, I know you collaborated on books that ranged from books about organization, you know, a best-selling Organize Yourself book, which I believe I've actually seen. Um, books on back pain, allergies, asthma, and then co-authored business books as well with strategies for, for survival and profit in the era of online business, money makeovers, how women can control their financial destiny. You are a prolific writer. So can you tell me a little bit about your career as a writer? Well, I guess that one of my first lucky breaks was that I was asked to do the election day book. And that seemed like such a great opportunity. And so I learned the whole process of finding out, you know, in those days, you actually had to write letters to historical societies and hope they would send you back information. But I learned the fun of telling these stories about people, you know, how they voted, where they voted, and how they celebrated the day. What could be better than that? And then I learned that people are only interested in election day every four years. Right. <laughs> so, so there was no money to be made in an election day book. So I had to, to figure out what was going to combine with being a home-based mother and right. also something that would be 
interesting. So I started doing the collaboration and the collaboration, some people would come into me with everything you would possibly want. Some people would come in with like one page of notes and I'd be like, oh, hmm, this is going to be interesting. So then I would look up everything you needed to. And then I always knew that I was going to be checked by a medical professional or checked by a business. So in other words, I needed to be right, yeah. but I didn't need to be perfect. So I did a lot of covering material quickly, figuring out what I needed to know, and then always had the expert there to say, mm, we can't quite go there. And so it was a, a good way to do it. I did try to keep two books a year going just because wow. the pace I know would go. And my children were very lucky that I had another place for my focus because <laughs> yeah. they got plenty of me. Yeah, right. <laughs> So it was one of those things that it, it worked out very well for all of us. It was a good home-based career. And I learned to be a fast researcher and a fast writer. And that was actually very, very valuable for the website then. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I you know, I was going to ask you about that, about your process of research. Because having I've been ingesting your content for months and months now. And everything I read it's so detailed and you can tell the research is impeccable. How do you go about all this research you do? Mainly by tracking down every single detail. I'm, I, first of all, you've got to be curious. That's you, you got to be curious about certain things. Like my Elmer's Clue article came because we had dinner with somebody who was talking about an art project made of Elmer's Clue. And I went home and I thought, I wonder where Elmer's Clue came from. It wasn't a very easy question to answer and it took quite a bit of hunting down to what glues used to be like and all that. But I guess for me, the important thing is I don't mind being stupid and asking the questions you, you and other readers need to know. So right now I'm doing a piece that involves one of Admiral Byrd's dogs. And one of the important things is, well, what was Admiral Byrd famous for? We know he was famous and I can only cover his early fame because the dog was with him in the early, before that early trip. But I make sure that I hunt down what what he was famous for. And I check everything on a map because it's one of those things like you hear all these stories that people write and you think, well, how far away was that? Uh, you know, it's like, and if you look it up and if you check the mileage, if you were driving it at all, it gives you the perspective of, oh, okay, that means a lot to me. And it can be something that I include in my writing. So I, you know, a lot of my stuff comes from ancient books. I find that the used book market is extraordinarily valuable because some of these books are published in 1928. Nobody's going to read them. Nobody's going to see them. And yet they're absolutely incredible stories. And then I do the research around them. And I, it's enormous fun. That's so great. Yeah, you, you're obviously an incredibly curious person. And I think that's kind of the the hallmark of all successful storytellers. I think that's absolutely true. You got to be curious, not only about the first idea, but then once you get into that idea, you have to say, hmm, like with Maiden Form Bras, they made a big deal about how her husband was the inventor of the bra. Well, if you really go through all the stories, she was the one in the back room fitting women, you know, building, you know, creating the, the bra that came about because she was putting inserts in women's dresses. And so he wasn't there doing that. She was. So it's one of those things like you got to look for those nuanced moments where you think this story got told based on what was appropriate yeah. in the era. Yeah. So in that instance, because he was the man, he was put out front because of the time it was, but she was really the inventor and the person doing all the work. And I feel like exactly. that probably happens a lot in history. Um, but yeah, for people who haven't been on on Kate's site, uh, America Comes Alive, you know, for instance, I never thought that I would be just captivated by a story about who invented the bra and maiden <laughs> form bras. But I've read that story. And while I was reading it, I mean, you know how fast content is now. People read really quickly. You're either interested or you're not. There's yeah. something about your content that hooks me every single time. And Thank I th you. Well, I think it's just you, you get to the heart of what it is to be human so quickly. Well, and I think also the idea that these are people you haven't heard of. Yeah. I mean, you've heard of Maniform, Maniform Bras, Elmer's Glue, but you have no idea what the story is behind right. those. So to be able to pull that information out is, and, and you know, but then some of the stories I find are just like dumbfounding. Like there was a story in 
Galveston, Texas. I, I'd read an article about a, a lifeguard who was not going to be accepted as a lifeguard because she was deaf and she was considering legal fighting of that. Well, somehow I came upon an article about, uh, and then eventually a whole book on a man in Galveston, Texas in the early 1900s who saved almost a thousand people. And he was a, a total, he was totally deaf. Wow. So his, his, he proved, now there were two things, a couple of things going on there. Galveston, Texas, the waters evidently are very unexpected. So, people were likely to swept up, be swept under without thinking about it. The other thing was people didn't learn to swim in the early 1900s. If you went to Galveston, you'd be like, oh, this is fun. Let's all go wander into the water and, and chat. Well, they wander into the water with inappropriate clothes. They're chatting and something comes along and pulls them up and he would be out saving five people at the same time. But he learned to assess the water based on what he knew about Galveston's water. And he could just, he didn't need to hear the waves. He didn't need to hear the call for help. He was just able to do it. So, so some of those stories are just like, well, clearly we should not be holding back on people who are deaf because they're compensating in another way for, for doing things like lifesaving. Yeah, that's really interesting. I remember that story. I read that story um, on LinkedIn and I loved it. And one of the things that made me think of was that, he was probably uniquely suited for that because I know in lifeguarding, you know, especially in beach lifeguarding, they can't hear someone yelling most of the time because of how loud the waves are, how far away they are That's from the water. Point. Yeah. So yeah. his other senses, his sight, his his ability to to really pay attention to details, you know, he's seeing what the water does. He's probably seeing a riptide start to form. And then, you know, those clues he's going to get better and better at because he only has the senses he has to work with. No, totally. No, that's, I hadn't even thought about the fact that the, the waves are so loud. So yes, you're absolutely right. So help is not going to exactly going to alert many people. So, uh, you know, what inspired you to start your website? Because it's, it is a, you have so much work on it. Well, thank you. And I, I consider myself very fortunate. I, I guess that I, I was working with a, the last book I wrote was with a chiropractor and he, it was supposed to be something he did with his father and the father died. And it was one of those things like he was totally not into this book and kind of had to develop the book anyway. And he was a lovely man. I'm sure he was a fabulous chiropractor, but writing a book was just not going to be his skill set. So we, we struggled through got the book out. And I just thought, wow, maybe I don't have to do this anymore. And my youngest daughter, Callie, had just gone off to college. And I thought, this is a time to reorient. And I, I was going back to my election day roots, the fact that I, was, I grew up in a small town in Colorado, Pueblo, and my parents always felt like, if you see a problem, you better figure out a way to participate in, in helping with the problem. You don't have to help with that problem particularly, but maybe you better free up somebody else so that they can help with that problem. So, so they were really community can-do spirits. And that's a little difficult when you're sitting in New York or Los Angeles for, for having that kind of activism that my parents were able to show. But I thought about how, you know, in 2000, 2008, people were pretty discouraged about this country. And I knew that wasn't what I had been taught as a child. I knew that love of country and pride in country were really important values. And I thought maybe there's a way to bring out these little known stories and make people feel proud. Then from there, you know, I started small and at the beginning of the internet, you could do 800 words and, and search engines thought that was just great. Fortunately for me, they now like longer and I like writing longer, but it's one of those things that to do the longer, more in-depth story is, is by far better. But I also became, uh, oh, I guess one of the surprises to me was I started with a black, you know, I was doing Black History Month, I was doing Women's History Month, all that stuff. And I thought, what am I doing with this Black History Month? Are they ever going to come and pay attention to me? And they do. It's one of the, I'm probably one of the top four or five profile sites for the number of people I've profiled. And one of the helps was I had a black filmmaker who would be working on short films and he would ask me to feature it. So we were able to work those together. And I know that he certainly helped build my audience. But then I figured, okay, if I can get a black audience coming to me for these 
stories, then we better get going on Hispanics, you know, Latinos. We better get going on every kind of hyphenate we've got in the country, which is, I'm going to have to live a long time. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to, you have a lot of writing to do. Well, exactly. And the whole thing about uh, disabilities. I mean, yeah. the disability community needs these stories done in an inclusive way. I had actually done Virginia Hall as a, you know, woman hero. But of course, I missed the, I mean, I knew and had mentioned the point that she had a wooden leg and she was then a, a World War II spy who achieved incredible things. I'm now going to go back and point out she had a wooden leg and did all these yeah. things. And it's one of those things like when I wasn't focused on it, I didn't make a big deal of it. But now it's, it isn't worth making a big deal, but it's worth making sure that it's clear to people that despite this adversity, she didn't consider it an adversity, which I think that a lot of people are, are there. They're, they're like, well, I am in a wheelchair, but I can still do a lot of things. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to give those people a voice and you know i'm eventually going to work my way through a lot of the things accomplished by the ada uh but curb cuts was my first story that to to be able to say because people and people are absolutely amazed they never thought about the fact that, i mean everybody uses curb cuts who doesn't choose to go down yeah the little ramp yeah but uh i one guy i ran into the other day said yeah i was so mad in the 70s when they started spending the money to to make those and, and now i'm in a wheelchair and i'm so glad they did and it's one of those things that those things are important to remind people that these things didn't happen by accident and it's really important that we we honor those who who fought for the rights for everybody yeah and i think that's i think that's the thing that has attracted me to your content so much because I've been a storyteller my entire life. I love stories. Um, it really is just the set at the center of what I do. But I feel like your site and all your content has this feeling of empathy and accuracy at the same time. So you're not spinning anything. You're not, you know, you don't have a bias. You're not trying to, you know, achieve a political agenda of some sort. You're just a good researcher telling a human story. And I, that's what the media should be in a lot of ways. You know, the, I, I miss that because it's like you're a reporter for good news. And, you know, I, I really respect that. Well, thank you very much. And I, on your podcast with Jay Harrington, he was talking about that thought leaders need to play the long game. And I thought, boy, is that a good way to look at this? Because my belief in this inclusive American history will probably come at some point, but it's going to be a while and people are going to find it niche by niche. And that's okay. You know, it's just one of those things that, but it, but it will make a difference. And certainly if you're sitting in high school and needing to do research, you don't have to limit your research if you find my website, because you're going to be able to do whatever story I've had time to do. Yeah. Which is a lot. <laughs> you're uh, on your website. You said one of the things that inspired you to start it is a quote from Jane Adams. Do you, do you, can you say that quote from the top of your head? I cannot do the quote, but the point is people want to hear great stories simply told. Yeah. Well, you just said it. It's basically that, okay. that people yeah. want, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah, that's okay. it, it is now one of my favorite quotes because I saw it on your site. Oh, that's, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I think you probably put it there when you first began, but it says people do not want to hear about simple things. They want to hear about great things simply told. Yeah. And yes. for everyone listening that doesn't know Kate, and you're hearing these snippets of these stories like curb cuts and all these things that, that are really specific stories, what's so interesting about them is it really is stories about everyday heroes, about people who solved a problem. So I look at your site. And I see hero's journey after hero's journey. And do you think of it that way at all? Yes, absolutely. But one of the things that I love about the website, and this is a current story because it's ongoing, is that uh, a few years ago, I did the story of White Christmas. How? Because people always talked about, was it written in Beverly Hills? And I thought, okay, well, I'll explore that. Because people, I like to have holiday stories at the holiday. So I was doing that story. And one of the side pieces was the fact that the playing of White Christmas and the announcement of the temperature being 108 was to be 
the queue in, in Vietnam that the Americans were to head for the embassy, that this was the time they were going to have to evacuate. So White Christmas and the announcement of the temperature was it. So I did this you know, little side story. Well, about six months ago, I heard from one of the helicopter pilots and he gave me some additional information on the helicopter. So I guess because the story had been out with him, more people were seeing it. And I had an irate comment from a man saying, tell the rest of the story. You haven't told the story. And I'm there like, well, I've got a lot on my plate. Yeah. trying to cover a lot of things, but I guess I better listen to this guy. So I sent him an email and I said, please share with, with me what you think. And he said, I was on one of the ships outside of Saigon and we were there to save the people who came by boat. And he, I think they had put 480 people on his boat and he described the kind of boats they came in. He described, he said, we weren't supposed to be accepting helicopters, but a lot of the Vietnamese helicopters did land there and unload. And all we could do was get the people out, grab whatever equipment we needed and push the helicopters off the edge because we needed to be prepared for more people. And the urgency in his story was so incredible. And then the story, I mean, he just said, I mean, he was just broken that they were not allowed to go back the wow. next day. He said there were yeah. still so many poor people to save. I really wish we had been able to go back. And so his story is there. And needless to say, starting about a week ago, that's my top story on my site yeah. right now because it is a direct analogy to Kabul and, and the evacuation of Afghanistan. So I'm sorry that it is analogous to it, but it's one of those things that I think that it gives people the heart for the pain and the difficulty of these people trying to get out. And also then the military trying to make the decisions about helping the people get out. It's got to be. I mean, this morning's news was the baby being handed over. The yeah, it's heart wrenching. And, you know, I think that's what, you know, it's it's really difficult in this world to do content without coming from some point of view. And for every story, like, for instance, the, the evacuation of Saigon, there are a million different points of view on that story. Like, if you're a refugee, you have a point of view. If you're a helicopter pilot, you have a point of view. If you're a politician, you have a point of view. You know, everyone has their own take on it. And that's what I think is so important about what you do and why I'm such a fan is because you you tell the story and yeah maybe it isn't the story from every single point of view but I think why your your Saigon article is popular right now is we've forgotten that we need to learn from what happened before and it's a really important touchstone so the so the service I feel like you're providing for all of us is we can actually go oh wait a minute this happened before Exactly. And my favorite part about it is the fact that people feel comfortable enough to meet with me to reach through the computer yeah. and say, you need to do this better. And I think that's that's the true gift. And I, I have always been that kind of person in person, but with COVID and all that stuff, I my muscles on that are, are weaker. But the idea that they can reach me online is just so touching. I mean, I've had people call and cry when they've read one of the posts about one of their family members and everything. And, you know, you just sit there and think, wow. That's really, that's amazing. I mean, I think it's, I think it's amazing that you'll sometimes adjust a story based on new information or feedback. I think it's really generous of you to take feedback and be so empathic about it. So I just think that's, that's really, you can tell in your work, you have a, you, there's an essence to your work that's very, like honors everyone. And that I think that's really, really special. So you have a lot of topics you write on, on your, I mean, a lot. Do you have any favorites out of all the topics you write on? Because you, you know, to just name a few, you have sections on your website that are American presidents and their families, inventors and entrepreneurs, inspirational women, heroes and trailblazers, Native American culture only in the USA, stories of war, like, it is just deep. How did you arrive at all that? Well, I know. Well, that's why I say I have to live a really long time. Um, <laughs> Good. I, I, so. I have a, a an Evernote list of a thousand ideas. 
So I'm not going to run dry anytime soon. And I guess that the probably the best example, I, I love all the topics, like I've already scoped out my fall and I know Hispanic Heritage Month is coming up in mid-September and I need to get something going for that. And, and so it gives me an opportunity to go back and revisit what's my most, what's the story calls to me the most from that category. And so I, I love the fact that I have to keep pace. But I guess the stories, the stories that surprised me the most were, were the dog stories. And um, someone I was working with at that time said, oh, well, there's this post office dog, Oni, maybe you should do something about that. Well, I did Oni the post office dog. And from there, I started doing more dog stories because one of the things that I learned, well, first of all, I learned that traffic in the internet drops down. Well, now it's less so with mobile, but it, it used to be just desktop and traffic would drop um, because it was summer. And so people were going out and doing fun things, except for those of us who like being at our computers. And so um, I thought, well, I need to have a way to bring people back to the internet and people love hobbies and dogs are a popular hobby. So pursuing it started out as a this is a good way to build traffic. But what it became was an incredible way to tell the story about American people. And every story about a dog tells a story about a community. I, I guess one of my favorite, I, I love Igloo, Admiral Byrd's dog, but the other story is Brownie, who was the town dog of um, Daytona Beach. And between the 1940s and early 50s, the town adopted this dog. He never went home with anybody. He sometimes stepped in front of a car and they had to get him to the vet and things like that. So what they did was they started a bank account for him so that he, Brownie would have funds for the next time he needed to go to the vet. So Brownie has a bank account and the town is taking care of him. He's got a place you know, to live by a bench and everything. And everybody loves seeing him in town. So I thought that was incredible because that told so much about Daytona Beach. But then we get to even more good stuff because when the fellow was sending me more material on Brownie and he had collected a lot, I come across an old pal, Elsie, from my Elmer and Elsie stories and Elsie the Borden cow and the big mascot. Well, it turned out in those days in the world of public relations, it was okay to have Elsie and M. Elmer summer in Florida, that it was a good news story that they were going to go to Florida to enjoy the summer. So Elsie and Elmer were off to go to, uh, to enjoy the summer. And Elsie has a PR date with, she's taking Beauregard, one of the calves, and they are going to visit Brownie and Brownie is going to walk down the street with them. Brownie is going to go into the bank, withdraw some money, come back out and they're all going to go down and Brownie is going to treat to ice cream. And what year was this? That's so great. That's <laughs> this a beautiful was probably story. Early 50s. Yeah, that's such a 1950s PR idea. It, it was it was so incredible because it, oh, and then there was another big phase where syndication came along and so, people started writing to the Borden company about Elsie because Elsie would be in a state fair on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And the syndication news services would cover the news nationally. And someone wrote and, she, and they said, my child doesn't like the fact that we're reading about another Elsie when we just saw the Elsie in Texas. So they had to learn that they had to be very careful about what they did with their news stories, which again is about the growth of newspapers and how those things go. I mean, it, it, it's just, and then the whole idea that this man who was sending me the material on Brownie had no idea that I had any interest in Elsie and Beauregard, but I had a lot of interest in Elsie and Beauregard. I think your focus on animals is what it's, it's kind of brilliant. And that's how I got hooked into your content. There was a story of reckless, the, the horse that yes. was a Marine. That's still for some reason, my favorite story. And I, and I read several of your dog stories, the Harvey and the barking dog of the Ohio civil war regiment. And all, I think what that does is it makes it really accessible to learn about history. And, you know, I, I learned a ton about the Korean War, but the reason I was reading it was because of Reckless the Horse. 
Exactly. And one of the things that I had very care, I knew nothing about the Korean War when I took on Reckless. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write about Reckless, I better know something about the Korean War. So my first was a step back to how can I tell this story simply so that I can get to the horse story. So thank you. I appreciate it. But it is one of the things that I work really hard at, at to make sure that people have a better understanding. And then, of course, I have quite a few people who flew in the in the Korean War and that sort of thing. And so all those stories blend together nicely. And yeah, I mean, it, it ends up being very rewarding because of all the ties. Yeah. yeah. So anyone listening, if you want to check out Kate's content, I, you know, go to uh, go to her site, America Comes Alive, and we'll have links and, and all that. But find the reckless, the horse that was a Marine story. And for me, at least, when I read that story, and it's not a short one, and, you know, I like content that's short, just like everyone else on the internet. But I was so hooked because it was it was a hero's journey, but the hero is reckless. And he went through a lot, and where he ends up is amazing. So yes. I won't spoil anything because I really want people to go read it. But that's an amazing story. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and one of my difficulties is that I'm not David McCulloch writing a full-length biography. So yeah. I, I, but I have to, but I have to include as much like nobody else is going to ever go look up Reckless. So I probably better include the majority of the details just so that it's there. And when somebody does research, but it is always that weighing of which way to go on that. Yeah. You're, I, I think you're sort of the, the brief David McCullough. You're like the, the, the accessible version of David McCullough with your writing. Um, because it's, you know, I, I've obviously read a lot, but I spend a lot of time on the internet and I love fast, quick bite-sized content. You know, I love it. And I love movies and stories and, you know, I've directed theater, but you know, the way you write, you get hooked, you get into the story. There's always, you learn things along the way. And I think that if everyone taught history, the way that you write, we would make a lot of, a lot less of the same mistakes over and over again. Well, thank you. I'll be 10 feet tall <laughs> the rest of the day. I got nothing but praise for you today because honestly, I'm a huge, I've become, I've went from being interested in your content, reading it, and now like I'm your, I'm, I might be your biggest fan now, I think. <laughs> we'll okay. see. I might start then, a fan club. I better develop t-shirts. Yeah, right? I think I need a t-shirt. I'm going to need a t-shirt. Um, so uh, I wanted to get, uh, uh, you know, as we're uh, working our way through the interview here, I want, what would be your advice to an it's aspiring writer or storyteller? Well, I think the most important thing are, are some of the points we've already talked about, which is be curious and be simple. Make sure you walk through the stories in, in as simple a manner as you can so that people will have a full understanding. And go back and do all the detailed research. Don't, um, you know, don't say he, you know, Reckless was in the Korean War. Assume that nobody knows, remembers what the Korean War was and what it was about and, and go back and pick up those details. Sometimes I'll even edit a piece and realize, hmm, this needs to be flushed out more. And I do. So I think that's one of the things. The other thing, of course, that every writer needs to remember is get the first draft down first. It's, it's always hard to get the first draft down. And then, I mean, I've got a piece that I'm, I'm completely reworking. I thought it was going to be ready for this morning and it isn't, but it's like, hold on to it until your draft is satisfactory because the re the rewriting, first of all, is fun. It's like doing a crossword puzzle, <laughs> moving things around. And second of all, that's what really makes the difference in terms of how people can read it more easily, you know, putting it away and reading it again. Um, a lot of the people you're talking about are telling a story about a company or something. And I think it's one of those things, like I think you're offering them a, them a really smart lens to be looking for those stories. You think about the Dove campaign that was about, uh, you know, freshness of skin and, and that sort of thing. I think anything like that, where you've got a story about the the customer and how successful that is, is much better than telling me what kind of product is in the soap. Um, so, so I think that you're absolutely right. It's, it's the way to go on those things. I think, you know, universally, since I was 10 years old, the only thing I've cared about is stories about human beings, you know, and I got hooked into storytelling by being a fan of monster movies as a 10 year old. So, you know, the classics, Dracula, Frankenstein, and those are all empathic hero's journeys where, 
you're, yeah, maybe briefly afraid of the monster, but you mostly feel bad for them. And you learn a lot along the way. And I think that just, as a, as a boy, that just hooked me. And I think um, storytelling is really powerful. And do you think about the power of storytelling when you're writing? I think about the, first of all, the honor of telling the story. And second of all, the importance of respecting the story. Um, so I don't necessarily think of it as power. I think of it as this is really important that I get this right for anybody who reads it, who knew this person or who might've been related to this person and that it is an honor. I mean, you're reading about some of these um, military heroes. Who, I mean, the, the triple nickels. I mean, they were the first black paratroopers and they taught themselves how to parachute out of planes. I mean, you know, they started out with all the, the you know, the things that the other men were learning on, but they were black. And so they were not given the training. So they taught themselves. And you think, wow, this is just really important to have that respect. And a lot of the material talked about how they were so disappointed because they didn't get sent over to Europe because that was what their goal was. But they were doing, they, they did something, a couple of very important things. One was Japan was sending over those, those balloons that were to blow up. And only a couple of them actually started fires, but it, it was a very real danger. So they were protecting us from something very important. And they were also the first smoke jumpers. Now, I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot of smoke jumpers right now with the size of fires we have now, but for a while, the smoke jumping career was really important. So, so they really were doing very important work. And I hope they feel very, I mean, they were disappointed they weren't in Europe but I hope they felt good about what they were doing because it actually was important. And unfortunately, the military probably didn't mean it to be important, but. I think that's one of the great things. And, and, you know, the way you honor people's stories is what I think there's real power in that. And what I mean by power is the not manipulating anyone, but you have an effect on people with how clear and how unbiased and how empathic your stories are, you know, and that, that really reaches me because when we're, you know, we're, we're not the classic kind of advertising agency. We are not going to sell you soap. We work with a lot of nonprofits and a lot of hospitals and, and nonprofit banking and that kind of thing. So we tend to just tell stories about people. And so I, uh, you know, I worked in documentaries for years. So I think that's why I love your style so much because a lot of times with a good story, all you have to do is find it and then get the heck out of the way. No, I, I think that you're absolutely right. It's important to have somebody who can tell the story and honor these people who are forgotten. And so it's like, I just have them lined up. I, you know. How do you get your, I, I think what I've heard a lot with people that are going to try to tell a story, whether that's about a business, whether it's content, whether they're trying to create content for themselves on LinkedIn, they get intimidated by how do I get an idea of a story to tell? How, where can I find an idea? And so what would you tell someone that's trying to do content or they're trying, they're a beginning storyteller? How do you get ideas? It's always probably the first one that's harder to, I remember when I was beginning to think about what, going more seriously into the website and everything. And I was always saying to people, what should I do? What should my focus be and everything? And then I guess it was because I was able to reuse, I mean, the election day information was always coming out of my book. So I was able to start there. And then I guess when you, once you get started, like, unfortunately, this story about Admiral Byrd's dog, I've got like three other stories that have come. One of them is about a man, two or more dogs. I mean, it's just one of those things like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to get to them. And I must push them out of my way because otherwise they're going <laughs> to, they're, they're going to crater whatever my schedule is going to be. But it, it's one of those things that as you begin to, and then write down all those great ideas that you have, or, or when you're out, if you're on a bus or a subway or something, I don't know, those ideas just pop. If, if you're, if you're used to watching for them or in conversation with people, people will say, gee, I always wondered how the umpire mask was invented. Yeah. You know, or like whatever, anything, well, there's right. an idea or whatever your product is. You know, I've always wondered how something, something is happening. I think that the ideas come in and then just jump in with the first one. Cause if you jump in with the first one, more ideas will come. I think that's great advice because starting is the key, like starting and then refining. So I found anytime I feel like I'm stuck for an idea, if I just get out of my own way and start, I'm usually fine. And it's kind of what, I was really surprised by, you know, a guest we had, Jay Harrington, 
who I'm a big fan of. And he said, you know, for his content, he gets stories every day. You know, he'll get a story from going to an ice cream parlor. He'll get a story from doing something. And then that reminds him of an analogy or reminds him of something that he wants to tell a story about. Oh, I, I can totally understand that. Or some, I know when I hear am near there and they're cutting grass, it reminds me of my childhood and the smell of, of mown grass. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I think, so. I think the ideas are everywhere. So all those things feed into something that can end up being a story or things you read. I mean, I have to say between the newspaper and any reading you do, there's always something that you can pick out and say, boy, this has got to become a story. Right. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And I think it's, uh, you know, there's just stories all around because a lot of times what people forget and this is what what I've always done for a living and do for clients is help them find stories. You know, they're like, well, how do we talk about this thing we want to talk about? And, you know, my go to always is let's find some human beings that have experienced it and tell their authentic story, because I would much rather tell a real story than try to make something up. I think real stories just resonate. Real stories about people always resonate. Absolutely. No, I agree a hundred percent. When you're sitting and you're working on, on one of these stories and you're putting out all this content, what makes you feel the most inspired or your best self? I always tell people that writing is like playing the piano <laughs> and you have to practice every day. So my best days are coming in every morning and doing something. And that makes me feel fulfilled and inspired. And we do go away sometimes. And there are a lot of things that interrupt that. And so I don't necessarily get to my desk every day. But for the most part, I pretty much keep a seven day schedule because it is like practicing the piano. It just even if I'm not writing, writing every day, I'm there, I'm manipulating the material, I'm going back through the website and deciding something needs to be updated or something. And so I think that's what makes me feel the most inspired. And, you know, COVID has been a help in the sense yeah. that it encourages my natural instinct to to just work within um but it is also really important to get out and all those things and so it's like now we're all at that stage where like oh you mean i really ought to go out <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah oh i should i should do that again that's interesting because <laughs> i i started this podcast during COVID, and the reason i did it is that i wanted to meet people like you and i wanted to tell your story for, for an audience. And that's really my, you know, people are like, what are you trying to do with their podcast? Is it a marketing thing? Not really. No, it's a passion thing for me. Like I really, really enjoy meeting interesting people that are storytellers. Well, and it's a great way to reach out and especially during COVID when we couldn't all be together. It's, yeah. it's the perfect thing. Yeah. I can have a really interesting one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, some of the brightest and best people that I know, which is really fun <laughs> right, for me. Exactly. That's really cool. Well, I guess the other thing I would add to that is everybody has a story. And one of the things when I am out and about, and my family is generally usually ready to kill me, <laughs> I like to stick with somebody long enough in a very pleasant, not, not invasive way, but stick with them long enough that I find out what makes their eyes light up, whether it's a hobby or an animal or whatever it is. And sometimes every now and then I'll hit the jackpot just as the rest of the family is beginning to leave and i'm there yeah. like, wait <laughs> i've i've hit i've hit gold here i got because of course when you finally gotten somebody to talk about something they love you're not going to walk out on them so it's one of those things like everybody's learned to you if you think about the idea that everybody you meet on the street from the gardener to the you know anybody has a story and they have something they really care about and if you spend any time with them, they'd love to tell you. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thought. I couldn't agree more. And I think I, I can picture you just, you know, your whole family standing by while you're <laughs> you're uh, learning a new story from someone new. And I can relate to that. I think it's a it's a magical thing when you meet someone and you have no idea what their story might be. Yes, and there, exactly. there's a million to tell. Do you think there are any myths, like anything that? people like make assumptions about writers or misunderstand about the craft of writing? I think craft is a really good word. I think it is a craft. I don't think it's an art. I mean, I don't think it's like a, it is not something that descends on you as a gift or anything. It's a craft. It's like, it's like being a really good woodworker. And I think if people 
assume that it's going to you're somehow going to be inspired i mean i think some of the people who are writing today are truly gifted and but i'm not i mean i'm not in the gifted category i'm in the i've learned to write the way a carpenter has learned to work with wood and i hope i'm very good at it but i think it is a craft and i think that the myth i i personally find writer's block a myth but it's one of those things like if you just don't you just don't go there. I'm not going to have writer's block because, well, first of all, with all the collaborating, I never had time. <laughs> so, so, and just keep going, just sit down, get started, and you're not going to get blocked. And if you do get blocked, you know, change pages and do something else and then come back to the, the next day. It goes back to the idea, 15 minutes at the desk with whatever was causing you trouble then come back the next day for the 15 minutes and it's probably going to be solved. Yeah. That's a very craftsman way or to look at it. And, you know, I think, I think, you know, that's like saying a carpenter that's building an absolutely beautiful house doesn't get to go. Well, I have house building block today. <laughs> nope. You don't get to see no, that. Sorry. <laughs> you know, so I think as a, as a writer that has done so much work and is so successful with what you do, I think you do have, it is a discipline and it's a craft. It's, and if you do it every day and you work at it, then yeah, your skills develop. And if you walk away from it for weeks and months at a time, you probably have to come back and work just as hard to get back to where you were. Exactly. You're rusty. You come yeah. back and you're just rusty. There's no other. And of course, it takes two or three days to get back to speed. It's not the end of the world, but it is one of those things that you feel like you were away. What do you think is the most important thing you've learned so far in your career? I hope the website. I mean, I think that, I mean, that is something that I still am 100% committed to building and working on, and it just needs to get bigger and better and more inclusive. And I'm very fortunate that my family and my husband particularly thinks this is a great pursuit. We, I'd gone through a phase where we accepted advertising and it was just, a, it started out well, and then it was just a mess because I'd said no, no video, no this, no that. And then pretty soon they were putting in video and all sorts of things in. And um, so this is a nonprofit enterprise that I have determined is going to be keeping me busy for the rest of my years. And I, I hope that it will be something that, that one of those daughters yeah. <laughs> will then maintain. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, it's quite a legacy. I'll tell you that, that much. Well, I hope so. In the meantime, I'm waiting for the grandkids to get old enough to call me for homework. I told them they don't have to read <laughs> everything. They can just call me. <laughs> yeah. I bet your. I'll tell you one thing. I bet your family doesn't misspell much or I bet your daughters know how to write. Yes, they do. They do. Yeah. All in different professions. Which sure. Is just well. But I bet they can express themselves well. Let me ask you just a few more questions and I'll make sure I get you out of here on time. But uh, what piece of advice were you given when you were first starting out or before you were doing the website? What piece of advice that were you given that stuck with you? Well, I was really lucky because one of the books that I was hired to write was a book on internet businesses. And we did that in the early, I guess, mid nineties. Um, and the guy I was working with was a guy who had created a website for Time Magazine uh, or Time Inc. in the very, very early days. So I was working with somebody who knew a lot at that time. And but he he scaled it down to what would the used car dealer dealer in a small town do with the internet and how could it help him? So uh, the book really covered. It, it was a big concept book, but it brought it down to a very um, manageable level. And so I learned all those lessons there and that was a tremendous help. And it also allowed me to get all the things like the domains that I wanted and all that. And I'm, I'm really sorry for all the other Kate Kelly's in the world, but I, I nailed those things down really early before the internet had actually been thought of. So um, it, it, it's one of those things that I think that that was probably my learning tool because it was just like, I, I had written it all anyway. That's really cool. So you learned a lot about uh, using the internet and how to how to set up your site by basically researching a book that you wrote. That's amazing. Totally. So what's something you? I'm sure you learn constantly. You know, you're curious. You're always writing. What's something that you've learned this week? I guess I, I go back to the story I'm working on right now, which is that before radio and television and the internet. The only way to spread the word was by traveling and giving speeches. And I had read, I have written about several different expeditions where 
there's a sled dog team that that traveled across the country and they stopped and gave speeches and everything. But I hadn't given much thought. The guy was going from from Nome, Alaska to Washington, D.C. So why not stop and give a speech, I guess, was what I thought. But in the book, in the section I'm working on now, Admiral Byrd sent an exhibit out to spread the word. He could he could network with the people who could pay for future expeditions. So he was Henry Ford, you know, President Roosevelt, all those people could be people he spoke directly to, but he knew he needed to spread the word to regular people so they would understand why it was important to go to the South Pole. So the exhibit traveled around the country and the people, someone from the expedition would go in and they would, they had a whole ex ex exhibition and then one or two of them would stick around to give speeches to schools and community members and everything. And then they would leave a couple of dogs with them and that kind of what happens to one of my dogs but um but it was one of those things but it brought the come you know it brought people in so you think about things like the world's fairs that they used to have that we used to really need i mean we don't need those things but these were a way of spreading information and getting people excited who else was going to hear about the south pole exploration unless you had them right there in your own community i mean how fun and to get to go and meet a sled dog and everything i mean those things were exciting and and Bird, and now that I realize it, so did other people realize that was actually a really important way of of spreading news about what he was doing and and why it was important. That's why I find uh, stories from history so fascinating. Is that you really have to use your imagination now in the world of cell phones of how difficult it was to learn about something like a polar expedition and how special it would have been to you to get those people to come to your town and how exciting that would have been. Now it's all at our fingertips. I think we take it for granted. Well, and one of the stories I wrote long ago was about before GPS. And the original advice to things would be like, go down, you know, such and such road and at the yellow house, turn left. But of course, then the story would go that the house was no longer yellow and the person missed the turn. And it's like, we all have our, our GPS on our phone and we don't have those kinds of problems. So it's, it's, it's a very different era. It's interesting. I traveled across country for about six months uh, in an RV before GPS. And we got lost about half the time. Uh, and the places sometimes where we ended up, it wasn't great or fun. But honestly, some of the accidents of like, we'd end up in a town we didn't even have any intention of going to were some of the best things that happened to us. So I think we we miss those happy accidents now. Oh, exactly. No, I, I agree. Those can be happy accidents, but also very frustrating. Sure, it's absolutely. Really, really trying to get a time. <laughs> it's a little bit of both, isn't it? All right, so I have one final question for you. I've had a blast talking to you today. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's been a pleasure. So it's a question I always end on. If you could tell your younger self something, what would it be? I was so naive. I had grown up in Colorado went to college in the East, ended up working in New York. And I didn't have, I, I wish, I wish someone or I could have told myself, it's okay to reach out for help as you need it. I, my parents were always very self-contained and they took care of everything themselves. And we rarely asked for help on any way. And I think that now one of the things I've learned is the whole generosity thing. People want to help you. And I just wasn't very good at reaching out for that kind of help but i also can say it all worked out <laughs> so so you know one way or the other you just keep on going and if you have a goal i i guess i should have said to myself it's still gonna be okay but you should ask for help <laughs> i think that's great advice i think you know I, I think a lot of people have a hard time learning that of that it's okay to ask for help and some people a lot of people just give it willingly like so thank you today for your help by coming on our podcast Yes. Oh, absolutely. Because I think people will really enjoy this episode. Follow Kate on LinkedIn and go to americacomesalive.com and look at Kate's content. And uh, I follow Kate on LinkedIn, so it's a great way to get little tidbits of her stories in your feed. Um, I think it'll enrich your life. You'll love what you read. So thank you for putting all those great stories and all that great energy out to the world, Kate. A total pleasure. <laughs>